Someone once said, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Meaning something that may seem broken or worthless could actually be a priceless gem. This is the story of us and Jesus. When reading the Gospel of Luke, we can witness the transformative power of Jesus on every page. We can see that nothing is too broken for Jesus to heal, and no one is worthless. All who believed in the Savior were restored. Jesus built his church on the faith of willing misfits who thought their story was over when it was only beginning. This invitation remains as true today as it was in the first century. Nothing is too broken. No one is worthless. And all who call on the name of Jesus can begin again. Transformation Church, welcome to all of our guests that are tuning in from around the country and literally from around the world. Welcome to our guests. Thank you. Let's give it up for the mighty men of Transformation Church, Kershaw and Lee Correctional Institutions, and the beautiful women of Camille. And thank you to our guests here at Transformation Church 521. Uh, we are continuing our series, You Can Begin Again. And beginning again is not just for people who are yet to discover Jesus. As we follow Jesus as his disciples, there are going to be many moments where we begin again. I know in the last three or four years, I felt like I've begun again about three or four times. And so following Jesus is this dynamic, continuous transforming of beginning again. And for those of you who are yet to discover Christ, God wants you to enter into his kingdom, into, into his world, to begin your beginning again process. So for the last three weeks, we walked with Jesus through the wilderness, okay? That was a season of preparation for his ministry. And never forget this, all right, teenagers, seriously, you ready? Don't rush away your life. Some of y'all ready to go to college? First semester, you're going to be ready to come back home. Some of y'all are going to be ready to get married. You're going to be ready to go back to when you wasn't married. So, hey, I, don't get destination disease. The greatest season is your season of preparation. Okay, so Jesus had a season of preparation. Now he's stepping out to say, this is what my mission is. And so one of the questions that we have to ask, and this is for those of us who followed Jesus a long time, because sometimes familiarity can breed contempt. For those of you who have yet to discover Jesus, the most important question we could ever ask is, who is Jesus? For you left brain people, there is the first blank to fill in. <laughs> who is Jesus? So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to unpack this. And explain it. Jesus is the Hamashiach. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Let me say it one more time. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus was Jewish. Now, as Americans, we grew up with a Jesus that looked like he was from Scandinavia. Okay? Or he was like this British dude. Come here, Peter. Let me hold your hand. No, no, guys. Jesus was a Jewish person in the midst of of a very Jewish world. He's also the world's savior. In a moment, you're going to see how this conflicts, not with us, but with the culture and sometimes with even the culture today now. So, so Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Let's open it up. This is Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 18a. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So Jesus is back home where everybody knows him. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So that's Saturday. The synagogue, the synagogue was a building, a structure just like ours, where there would be teaching and singing and praying and all those things. How did the synagogue develop? 
when the Jewish people were in Israel, when they were in the Middle East, or when, when they were in Israel, they could go to Jerusalem to worship. Well, through disobedience, something called the Jewish diaspora took place, and Jews were led all throughout the Greco-Roman world. And to worship, they built these little worship centers or houses called synagogues. So that's where we get the idea for these types of structures. When a new rabbi would come to town, and especially when you're from that town, they ask you to read. So Jesus stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given him. So teenagers, they didn't have Bibles back then. They had scrolls, and this is our attempt at a scroll. But I've seen the Dead Sea Scrolls, and these things are long, okay? So Jesus gets up, and he unfolds the scroll, and it's for the book of Isaiah. Now, as a first century Jew, in this context, your ears would have got excited. Because Isaiah was a great prophet. He found a place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me. He has anointed me. So what's happening right now is the Jews are going, oh man, oh man. Not Drake, oh man, but oh man. Oh man. You know, you know why? He's quoting Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. And Isaiah, in a moment you're going to see Isaiah 58. Why is that important? Because that's about the Messiah. Let me give you a little insight into what a Jewish synagogue of that era looked like. Okay. So this right here is in the village of Migdal where Mary Magdalene is from. I was there back in uh, February. And so this is a Jewish synagogue, first century, second temple Jewish context. Like 100% chance Jesus would have preached in here. Not a very big crowd, is it? There's about 150 people in this village or, or, or so, and it was right on the Sea of Galilee, very, very pretty. But anyway, this was really neat to kind of stand there and be like, wow, somewhere in here Jesus preached. That was cool. All right, so in this context, as Jesus is preaching, there's a backstory. Here were the Jewish people. God's chosen people that God made a covenant with. He says, I'm going to give you some land, and you're going to be my people, and I'm going to be your God. But here's the problem, though. Here's the problem. There's an impressive superpower that's dominating Israel and the Jewish people called Rome. If you don't know that, you are going to misinterpret the Bible. You've got to understand, there's a context. The Jewish people were under Roman occupation and Roman oppression. And you know what they were looking for? A Messiah, a Hamashiach. And you know what that Messiah's job was? Set us free from these godless Gentiles. The common interpretation or understanding from a first century Jewish person of a Gentile was, Gentiles are sexually perverted, they worship false gods, they're evil, and throughout the whole history of being a Gentile, I mean a Jew, what did they experience from Gentiles? In Africa, Pharaoh wanted to make them slaves. When they started journeying to the promised land, these Gentiles called Canaanites, Hittites, Anstadbite, all these other Avites, the Ninevites, wanted to destroy them. Haman wanted to destroy the Jews. And now you're in God's promised land. And what are Gentiles doing to you now? Enslaving you, raping your w women, hanging you on a cross. How would you feel about Gentiles? Now, are you ready for this? If you're not an ethnic Jew, that's you, the oppressor. So often we as Christians read it as though we're the Jews. No, you would have been on the side of Rome. I would have been on the side of Rome. For all, we always make ourselves the good guys in the story. No, you and I would have been with the Gonim, the Gentiles. They were looking for a Messiah who would obliterate the Romans and set them free. From a Jewish mindset, eternal life was about God's kingdom on earth to worship him. That's kind of what Jesus said too, wasn't it? Or did we forget his words? 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, why is always we be telling people, believe in Jesus. When you die, you go to he heaven. That's part of the story. That's not the whole story. Remember the end of the Bible, people have resurrected bodies on earth. I also think that's another trick of the devil. Because why does discipleship matter when the goal is just to get you out of here? Discipleship matters because the goal is the God of heaven unleashes heaven through us who are conformed to the image of Christ. So they were looking for a Messiah to do work and to get rid of the Romans. Well, what was his mission? Teenagers, this is so important. We established who he is, the Messiah, the world's Savior, and he has a mission. So let me pause here. This is, this is really important. So parents, when you have your children, right, your job isn't just to raise them like, hey, do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, and I'm going to love you. And every time you ask for something, I'm totally going to give it to you. You want a car? You want to drive and drink? Go for it because I love you. I'm never going to discipline you. The purpose for your life is just do whatever you want to do. That's called hate. That's not love. Well, why do we think following Jesus is any different? Think about it, how we pray. God, I need this, I need this, I need this. Have we paused to go, God, what do you want? Hold on. I don't, wait, 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 wait. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Have we paused in our prayers to go, God, what do you want? Don't approach God as a consumer, but as a participator. We live in a country filled with consumerism, and you are a unit to produce profits. And we approach the church the same way. We approach Jesus the same way. We go, Jesus, hey, um, I don't know what your mission is. I really don't care, but I got some stuff to do and you need to do it. Friends, that's not the God of the Bible. That's a genie in a bottle. What's his mission? Here it is. Verses 18b through 19. To preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover sight of the blind and to set free the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now let me pause here. Guess what Jesus is doing? He's quoting Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2 and Isaiah chapter 58 specifically part D of that verse. Hey friends, the New Testament is just the Old Testament. That's why we want you to read the Bible. It's a love letter for us to know God's story. If you don't know God's story and where you fit in it, guess what you're going to try to do? Make God fit in your story. This right here, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's Leviticus chapter 25. So what is Jesus' message? He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. You know why? They're like... Oh my gosh, this is Jesus. And he just read Isaiah. And he, and he began by saying to them. Now, verse 21 is Jesus' drop the mic moment. Um, I've read and viewed a lot of critically acclaimed academic movies like Coming to America. <laughs> and do you guys remember when Sexual Chocolate was singing? <laughs> we are the children. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Y'all remember that? Show them all the beauty they possess and so. You remember that? And then he drops the microphone and he goes, Y'all remember that? This is Jesus says, I'm about to drop the mic. You know why? Because the world is about to change and you can begin again. Here it is, teenagers. Here, here it is. Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. He goes, the Messiah that you've been looking for is here. And you can begin again. Let's look at his mission and break it down. First of all, Jesus' mission is to preach the good news. To preach the good news. And, and I'm a little biased, but I think we do a really good job here of reframing with a deeper scriptural understanding that the good news or gospel is not this. You deserve to go to hell. Jesus got on a cross, took away the wrath. Now you don't have to burn like a Jimmy Dean sausage for eternity and believe in him and good luck the rest of your life. Friends, it's not the good news. 
Here's the good news. In Genesis 10 and 11, God saw that his family was rebelling and he spread them apart. But in Genesis 12, he found this pagan named Abram, changed his name to Abraham, which means father of many. And he says, Abraham, through you, look at the sun, look at the stars, look at the stars. I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to be your God. And through you, your family is going to be bigger than all the stars that you see. And through Abraham, there became Isaac and Jacob. And then the whole nation of Israel, the nation of Israel existed to be a light to the Gentiles. They failed at that. And so Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, comes. And you know what the Jewish Messiah does? For 33 years, Jesus lived a perfect life because you and I are imperfect. Jesus lived a sinless life because you and I are sinless. In other words, Jesus says, Daddy, what I do accredited to those who believe in me. So Jesus' perfect life is given to us. In other words, Jesus rewrites our story with his story. In other words, Jesus takes our messy picture and paints a new one and says, Dad, they did it. I got to confess something. In sixth grade at Irving Washington Middle School on the west side of San Antonio, Texas, I cheated in art class. I couldn't draw, but Hector Gonzalez could. <laughs> so I was like, yo, Hector, now I ain't telling y'all to do this. I was like, yo, Hector, man, why don't you draw me a horse? So Hector would draw everything for me, and I end up passing the class. Totally cheating. It was wrong. I was in sixth grade. Oh, well, guess what? <laughs> Jesus cheated for us too. He lived a perfect life because you and I couldn't. Would you accept it? Would you receive it? I know it's not fair. I know it's cheating. That's why it's called grace. But not only does he live a perfect life for us, on the cross he takes our place and he atones for our sins. Atonement for a Jewish person meant that the blood of the spotless lamb covered over our sins, so much so that our sins were forgotten, thrown in the sea of God's forgotten memory. But not only forgiven, Jesus raises again from the dead to make us alive. Never forget this. God does not come to make bad people good. He comes to make good. He comes to make dead people alive. And so through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are born again. We are saved from eternal separation, brought into God's eternal kingdom to be his family here on earth. For those of you like in your 50s or 60s, do you remember when you would leave the house and your mom or grandmother or your mama name, daddy name, however you used to say it, Peepaw, Mima, whatever. They would say, remember your last name. Remember your last name. Because you represent that name. <laughs> well, God wants us to represent his name. That's why he brings us into the kingdom. To represent his life to the world. That's the good news. Is there's a good, good father who says, I want my family back. And who is this family going to be? He preaches the good news to the poor. Um, in order to interpret particularly this part of the scripture, it requires something that we've lost in our society, uh, common sense. If Jesus only preached the gospel to people who were financially poor, Hardly anyone in the United States of America would be eligible to receive the gospel. If you make over $12,000 a year by the world standard, particularly in third world countries, you are very wealthy. It's important for you to understand that. Uh, when I went to Calcutta, India, I vowed to understand, Derwin, you have no idea what it means to be poor. Growing up on welfare is not poor. Calcutta, India, living in a garbage dump, living on the side of the road your whole life, now that's poor. So if Jesus only preached to those people, then we would, really wouldn't have a chance. What's happening here is Jesus is saying, I'm preaching to all of humanity because you're spiritually bankrupt. You have insufficient funds in your account to rescue yourself. Jesus is saying, as Paul phrases, here's my unsearchable riches. 
The unsearchable riches of Jesus is his perfect life. The unsearchable riches of Jesus is the cross. The unsearchable riches of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And God is going, I want to put that in your spiritual bank account, which is your life. I want the riches of Christ to be yours. Now, here's the thing. In order to follow Jesus, it requires you understanding that you're poor. I, I know some of you are going, well, preacher, you don't know me. I'm a good person. And my question to you would be, compared to who? How do you know you're good unless you judged yourself better than someone else? In Luke chapter 10, I believe, verse 18, Jesus squashes that and he says, only God is good. You see, our standard is with God, not other people. So in light of God, on my best day, I don't qualify. On my worst day, I don't qualify. That's why we must look to Jesus as our qualifier. Now, Jesus did minister to the poor financially, and God has a heart for the poor. Why? Because poor people are taken advantage of over and over and over and over again. All throughout history, poor people are taken advantage of. There's a word for that. It's called injustice. As Christians, we should want a just society for everyone because our God has been just to us. Now, Christian, this is important. I'm speaking to Christians. Not everybody here is a Christian. Yeah, I'm speaking to Christians. Just because something in society that is unjust is not your problem doesn't mean you shouldn't be concerned about it. If you're a Christian, you ready for this? If you're a Christian... No, I'm, I'm talking about a real one, a Bible one. If you're a Christian, injustice anywhere means injustice everywhere, and we should care about it because Jesus cares about it. So, so hold on. So, 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 you, so, 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 we should care about this. Why are there so many abortion clinics in the hood? And we should care about this. Why in the hood are there buildings that, 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 that say, title loaning. In other words, give me the title to your car and I'll loan you money at an outrageous rate. Or I'll cash your check and charge you a percentage of it. I don't see those in Valentine. We should care about the groans of the other that's not like us. Christian, stop being discipled by CNN Stop being discipled by Fox, good God. Stop being discipled by MNSBC or whatever it's called. And please be discipled by the Bible. Turn off the talk radio and read the Bible. So many of us are making decisions through a political lens instead of the kingdom of God lens. And we go, well, that's not my problem. Well, you know what? I wasn't really that much into cancer until 2004 on May 17th that my wife was diagnosed with cancer. She's cancer-free, praise God, she's great. But we've become advocates now. You know why? Because we we're affected by pain. Don't wait to pain to become an advocate. Don't wait until pain to become an advocate. So if there's a segment of society going, hey, there's a problem, hey, there's a problem, don't go, well, I don't have that problem. Or you're just making it up. You're lazy and don't want to work. Do you know how dark and demonic that is? I didn't hear Jesus go, eh, you Gentiles, man, you guys, y'all just suck. Yeah, you're just lazy. You don't want to work. I didn't hear that. Love says, I want to hear your story. I want to seek to understand. Injustice anywhere should be, injust should be injustice everywhere. Jesus ministered to the captives. All of us are born in captivity. And we're all born captive to sin, death, and evil. We're all going to sin, break the heart of God, hurt other folks. All of us are. One out of one people die. And all of us have experienced evil and have perpetrated evil. Some of us go, well, Derwin, I'm not evil. Do you gossip? 
Do you lie? See, once again, our standard is from a human perspective and not God's perspective. The greater we see God, the greater we appreciate his grace. Jesus says, I come to set the captives free. Some of us are captive to, to habits and, and hang-ups and, and things that we just can't seem to shake. For some of us, we've lived as Christians for years, and you're like, man, I am, I've been a Christian for 20 years spiritually, but emotionally I'm six months. You fly off the handle. Oh, my goodness, don't catch an airplane ride. Man, Christians on an airplane, serve me, you stewardess or steward. All the world revolves around me on this plane. Oh, my goodness, the plane is late. Like, dude, let's just make it safe, okay? Like, can we just make it safe before we complain? Why do y'all treat stewardess and stewards that way? They're human beings made in the image of God. They got all these people to deal with, and you treat them like they slaves. Seriously. Um, last I checked, one of the fruit of the Spirit for Christians was not mean, was not impatient. No, no, you really want to be disciples, right? Or do y'all just want to learn something about Jeremiah building or Nehemiah building a wall? Or do you want God to tear down the emotional walls in your heart so you can really love? Because taking a theological test is easy. But this thing called life in the Spirit, mm. So God wants to set us free. He wants to set us free to be a part of the kingdom of light, to push out the kingdom of darkness, which is more than a tweet. Did y'all hear what I just said? It's more than, oh, I tweeted, man, I did my job today. Yeah. Whew. Blind. Jesus obviously healed a man that was blind. I think it was at this service I was preaching and um, um, my throat lodging flew out of my mouth and I almost hit a guy. And I was like, well, Jesus healed with spit. I'm going to heal you with a throat lodging, right? <laughs> um, so I just kept on going. But anyway, yeah, so, so Jesus healed people that were physically blind. But the greater narrative here is this. We're all born spiritually blind. My wife and I will talk about it often. It's like, can you believe we used to see the world the way we used to see it? Guys, for like the first five, six years of my marriage, I wouldn't even hold my wife's hand to pray. I was so like insecure and like, uh, get out of my space. I love you, I think, but I don't really know what that means. I like you. You like me. We're good housemates. But here's the problem, though. Is, is I was spiritually blind and, and, and I couldn't see. A part of coming to Jesus is this miracle, is that you get to see life. And one of the first things I was able to see was how messed up I was before I became a Christian. It was like an act of mercy. If I knew how messed up I was before I became a Christian, oh, Lord, have mercy. It was like simultaneous. I was like, oh, my gosh, I am a mess. And simultaneous was like, but God loves this mess. Um, so probably after about sixth grade, I didn't talk to my biological father, uh, addiction, incarceration. Um, so I've probably in the last, I'm 46 since, since 12, I've probably talked to him a hand, you know, 20 times on the phone, real short bursts. And, uh, recently, uh, he, he, uh, uh, he had a heart attack, um, a stroke, his kidneys are he had an aneurysm as, as well. So he's in the hospital, and my half-sister from my dad's side called me saying, you know, we, we two are his kids, right? So I'm on the phone. I'm ushered into this thing, and the nurse is calling me, and she's asking me questions about my dad. And I, I, go, I go, ma'am, I can't tell you nothing about his medical history because I really don't know him. So in that mo moment, it was, it was like this movie where the camera just zooms in. I'm like... Wow, that really hurt. Man, like, I couldn't imagine not being present to my children. And for so many years, I was blind towards my father. And you know what that blindness did? It filled my soul with unforgiveness towards him. 
But when I became a follower of Jesus, it took a couple years, God opened my eyes to not be angry at him, but to give compassion towards him. You know why? Because Jesus was compassionate towards me. How dare I withhold the same grace that I was undeserving? Some of y'all holding on to the grace God gave you. You didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. That's why it's called grace. Uh, see, I've been a Christian almost, what, 20 years now, something like that? Yeah, 20. And this was probably about uh, 14. I mess up n numbers. My wife's up there like, no, it's not. So forgive me if I'm off a little bit on the numbers. Right? I got hit in the head a couple times. <laughs> um, I wrote the hardest letter I've ever had to write. I didn't know where my dad was, found out he was incarcerated, and, and the letter was short. It simply said, Dad, I want you to know I love you, and I forgive you, and I want you to be a part of my life. I want you to be a part of uh, my Vicky's life, and you've got some great grandkids that you need to meet. Now, I did not want to send the letter, but I'm sure Jesus did not want to get on the cross. Teenagers and preteens, hear me loud and clear. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to ask you to do some things that you don't want to do, but that you need to do. So, sent in the letter. A little time came by. Uh, it was a handwritten note. I know he didn't write it because my dad can't read or write. Can you believe that? They just passed him along to school because he could run fast with a ball in his hands. So, but whoever wrote the letter for him, it said this, um, thank you for forgiving me, and I want you to know I do love you. And he did the best that he could. Teenagers, your parents did the best that they could. There's only one whose best is the best of all, and his name is Jesus. He says, I, I, I love you, I forgive you, and I do want to know your kids. Now, has it been perfect? Do we talk a lot? No, that's just where it is with his, with his life, but I want you to know that when I was blind, I was filled with unforgiveness and revenge. And when God opened my eyes, I was filled with compassion and mercy and love. And don't you think we as the church, I'm not even talking about people who don't know, your, know Christ yet, but don't you think we as the church should be the ones exuding love and compassion and not nonsense on Facebook and Twitter and in our conversations? I mean, because Jesus did say in John 17, that's still in the Bible, you will know my disciples because they cuss pe folks out on Facebook. <laughs> you will know my disciple because they're hardcore conservatives or Democrats or libertarians. You will know my disciples because they love one another. And you know what love always de de demands? The sacrifice of self. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to be a living sacrifice. I want us to be a church that's a living sacrifice because we viewed and have tasted the mercy of God. And then the poor, the captive, and the oppressed. Jesus ministered to those who were under demonic oppression, physically and spiritually. So, so please, un please understand this, right? There are only two teams. And let me give you an illustra illustration. There is Clemson football and South Carolina Gamecock football. There ain't like, well, I'm for one and the other. Nope. It's one or the other. It's kind of like being half pregnant, not possible. <laughs> so here's the deal. There's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And all of us are born under the kingdom of darkness. That's all we need to be born again under the kingdom of light. Like this is a urgent message. There ain't like, yeah, Jesus is cool. No, it ain't no Jesus is cool. It's total allegiance. Not perfection, but total allegiance. We're all oppressed. Like, there are things that we do that we go, why am I doing this? And Jesus wants to set us free. All right, let's go to verse 22 through 30. So Jesus was speaking. They were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. They were like, woo, look at, woo, 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 look at little Jesus. Man, Jesus grown up. 
He's preaching this awesome. Man, is he really the Messiah? And watch what happens next. Yet, they said, isn't this Joseph's son? They're like, wait, wait, wait. Now, that sounds good, but yo, man, that's Joseph's son. You remember Joseph? He passed away. But you remember his girl, Mary? Oh, yeah. Wait, Mary's the one who said God got her pregnant with Jesus, right? Yeah. Oh, man, that can't be the Messiah. And then it's like, well, you know, this is what I heard. Now, I'm not gossiping. I'm just letting you know what you need to pray for. This is what I heard. I heard Mary was up in the club, not a Jewish club. She was with them Romans. You know, them Romans be wilding out. They be twerking and everything. She had a little bit too much to drink. She hooked up with Claudius, and there was Jesus. Hey, guys, a second century Jewish Talmud document says Mary was a whore. That's what it says. They didn't believe there's a virgin birth. So you best understand that they were like, yeah, but that's Mary and Joseph's son. Hey, isn't it good news to know that God takes people from jacked up families and does amazing things? So if you come from a jacked up family, God wants to use you. Hey, let me preach for a minute. I don't even care about the Panthers game. Yeah, I, actually, I do. I'm going to hurry up. But anyway. <laughs> let me, let me, here, check this out. You can begin again. Let me tell you something. You can begin again. It doesn't matter your family of origin because I know a God who will reach into your mess. I know a God who will take and do something with your life no matter what your family of background is, no matter what your uncle did, your cousin did, your mama did, your grandpa did. There is a God who can do great things through your life. Verse 23, then he said to them, no doubt, You will quote this proverb to me, Dr. Heal Yourself. What we've heard that took place in Capernaum, do here in the hometown also. So Jesus had done some miracles, and they were like, well, if you're really not Joseph's son, wow us with miracles. Y'all, it is about to get real. Verse 24, he also said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Quick side note, this is so true. My family, for the most part, back in Texas, has no clue what's happening. Until my mom actually came here and was baptized. She was like, y'all have a building? She's like, oh, wow. She's like, y'all on the Internet. Y'all big time. They're like, you wrote a, you wrote a book? Oh, yeah, I'm going to write a book too. Like, they have no idea. And, and so... I'll be talking to my family like, you know, hey, uh, I want to give you some advice. And they're like, oh, you just dewey. I'm like, there are people who come to my office and God uses me to change their lives. <laughs> like perfect strangers from around the world. Oh, you just dewey. I'll be like, well, Lord, you got them. I-, I learned that about 10 years. I'm like, Lord, you got them. Now watch this. But y'all know God loves big butts and he cannot lie. Hey, on a serious note, though, what's about to come next, Satan has got us to deny. Watch this. But I say to you, now remember he's speaking to Jewish people in a Jewish synagogue. There were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah days. Oh, yeah, we remember Elijah. When the sky was shut up for three years and six months while a great famine came all over the land. Yet... Elijah was not sent to any of the Jewish widows except a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. Guess where Sidon is? Phoenicia. Guess what Phoenician people are? Gentiles. Let me help you out a little bit more. And the prophet Elisha. Elijah and then his homeboy Elisha, two of the greatest prophets in Israel, There were many in Israel who had leprosy. And yet, not one of them was cleansed except Nahum the Syrian. First of all, I really wish God would stop talking about race in the Bible. I mean, Jesus is a Jew. He's in a Jewish synagogue. Talking about a Phoenician woman and a a Syrian. Jeez. I mean, it's not like the world is comprised 
of one race called the human race, and Jesus wants to save that human race. I mean, for goodness sakes, let's not talk about race in the Bible. Do you see how we've been blinded? The whole Bible is about God saying to Abraham, I'm making a family out of the human race. And we've totally missed that. Let's don't talk about race. Okay, Jesus ain't Jewish then. Let's don't talk about race. Guys, it's right here in the text. Watch what happens because of race. When they, this is the Jewish synagogue, when they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. Enraged means mad. Look at how mad. They got up, drove him out of town, and brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on, intending to hurl him over the cliff. Okay, let me give you the scene. Jesus breaks down. Hey, you remember Elijah? Remember Elisha? The Jewish people needed help. He went to Gentiles. Oh, no, you didn't, Jesus. They get up, and Jesus turns to Usain Bolt. <laughs> Guys, this isn't, this isn't like, okay, peace out. He is running. They want to throw Jesus over the edge. Teenagers, why? He buddy passed right through the crowd and went his way. Why did they get angry at Jesus? Why were there... Jewish people angry at Jesus. Here you go. Because God's universal love towards the Gentiles was the source of rage of these nationalistic Jews. Now, before you get mad at the Jews, once again, let's enter their world. You're being oppressed. By Romans, you have no rights. Jesus was not the first Jewish man put on a cross. Jewish men on crosses would line up the streets to tell you, don't get out of line. These were Jewish people in the promised land. And they had just heard, if you're the Messiah, then our day of deliverance is coming. Matter of fact, let me, let me make it a little bit more tangible for you. It's like African slaves going, set us free. And if you got to use violence to do it, do it. By the way, that's called the Civil War. Hmm, you didn't know we was going to get that real, did, did you? Guys, we didn't, it's right here in the Bible. So, so what's happening here is they're saying this. Jesus, if you're the Messiah, make Israel great again. Kick the Roman. Hey, stop laughing. I am serious as a heart attack. And here's why. I am tired of God's people being political pawns. I am sick and tired of it. I am up to my, I am so tired of it. I'm not using that about some president. I know. They wanted Israel to be great again. And Jesus said, you've got to understand, the Romans who are oppressing you are in sin. That's why they're oppressing you. Let me set them free, and they will set you free. He's not just the Jewish Savior. He's the world Savior. That's why I opened a sermon with Jesus the Messiah, the world Savior. Sometimes we want God just to save people who look like us. Sometimes we want God just to save people who we like. And he's coming and saying, no, 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 no. Remember, I made a covenant with Abraham that the good news is God's making a family comprised of all the families. How do we know this? Glad you asked. I, hey, by the way, the Bible's a good place to learn about Jesus. I like preaching it. Now, the scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles. Let me pause here. If you're not an ethnic Jew, you are a gonim. You are a Gentile. Stop reading the Bible as though, I'm the Jew. No, 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 no. You're the Gentile. By faith and proclaim the gospel, that's good news, ahead of time to who Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed through you. Here's what the Jewish people forgot. Isaiah 49, verse 6. You are to be a light to the Gentiles. You know what happens when there's oppression 
terrorism, you get fearful, and you get insular. And God is going, where there's perfect love, I cast out all fear. I'm going to teach you to love the one who oppresses you. Isn't that what God did for us? Didn't he love us while we were enemies? Once again, the Bible is a really good place to learn about Christ. There's a scripture called Romans 5, 9. It says, while yet we were enemies, through the blood of Christ, we've been declared righteous. So if God loves enemies, what should his people do? I mean, do y'all really want to be disciples or do y'all want an entertainment show? Because we could hire uh, Hamilton. They could come in and we could entertain you to death. Did you catch the words? We could entertain you to death. God wants you to have spiritual life. This is fun. Okay, here it is. We're about to wrap this up. Your mission is Jesus' mission. Will you accept the responsibility? You're going, Pastor, what do you mean? First of all, if you're a follower of Christ, guess what the Bible calls you? The body of Christ. So if you are the body of Christ, what does that mean? It means that his mission now becomes your mission. How else is Jesus going to accomplish his mission and ministry if he's in heaven right next to his daddy interceding on behalf? He sends the Holy Spirit so you and I can continue his mission and his ministry. And I know what you're thinking, whether if you're a teenager or you've been around the block a couple times. I know it. You're going, yeah, but preacher, man, um, I, don't, I don't have nothing to offer God. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mess. I'm a... I'm a wreck, and uh, uh, man, I, I, I don't have nothing to offer him. Yes, you do. You ready? Here it is. God does not need your strengths. You know why? Because he's infinitely strong. God needs something from you that he does not have himself. You ready? Your weakness. He has no weakness. So guess what he wants you to do? He wants you to bring your weaknesses to him. Now listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. He wants you to bring your weaknesses to him. He wants you to bring your weaknesses to him because he doesn't have any. And he'll take your weakness and he'll turn it into a strength. And when you try to get arrogant and when you try to get boastful, he'll remind you that it's his glory. Guys, listen to what I'm saying. Every Sunday morning, I am so honored to stand here. My whole life until I was 26, I couldn't even talk. I'm a compulsive stutterer. He will use your weaknesses. He doesn't need, oh, somebody help me. Somebody help me preach today. Somebody help me. Somebody help me preach today. He doesn't need your strength. I'm trying to let you know. Bring him your weaknesses and he will blow your everlasting mind. Not for your glory, but for his. We've been taught, be strong, be strong. He's like, no. This is in the Bible, by the way. Book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 3. Bible's a good place to find out about Jesus. <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs are the kingdom. Poor in spirit goes, here's my weakness. And God goes... I got you, because I'm infinitely strong. So, this is what I'm not asking you to do. I am not asking you to go to work or go to school with a big old King James Bible and stand on the desk and go, today the word of God is going to be preached in this workplace. That's annoying. So what I want you to do. I want you to wake up and I want you to say, Father, give me a heart like yours. Break my heart for the poor. Oh, God, break my heart for the captive. God, break my heart for the blind. Break my heart for the oppressed. Bring them to me and let me stretch out the nail-pierced hands of the Messiah, the world Savior. 
Don't worry about a program. You'll find nowhere in the Bible an evangelism one-on-one class how to share your faith. You just, you, just, you just go love. There's a coffee shop that I go to. I've been going there for like 10 years, longer than that. I write books in there, sermons. But you know what I do? I pray, God, bring me the poor. Bring me the brokenhearted. Bring, bring me those people. You know how many people I've hired on staff from that Starbucks? It's, a, it's, it's amazing what happens when we just slow down and say, God, give me a heart like yours. That's what it means to join Jesus on mission. You won't even have to go look for people. They'll come find you. By the way, kindness and love is a magnet. Well, here's our soul tattoo. Man, I got to stretch my calves after that jumping. I got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to plug into the Transformation Church community. And then I want you to live on mission, and it begins with prayer, okay? People are all around us. Bring God your weakness. Now, here's something that we learned about transformation through mission UIO. Two things. The first thing, you guys love Jesus. You love people. That was evident. And secondly, a whole bunch of y'all are not in TC groups and you don't serve. So it's time for you to get in the game. Hello. You're like, oh, Transmate Church is so great. Well, join in and use your talents too. Listen, I believe God is going to use us to do things well above and beyond. Did you know there's like this movement in Nigeria that's happening as a result of what's happening here at Transformation Church? We got leaders from Nigeria coming saying, within our cities, there is ethnic division between the Nigerians, Christians, and we need the gospel to do what you guys are doing there at Transformation Church. Like, it's, it's happening. There are so many things that's happening, but it's going to require all of us. And one of the first steps is get into Transformation Church community. So today at 4 o'clock, we're doing some baptisms. We're going to be outside. Yes. We're going to have food trucks. Uh, it's going to be, uh, I, I mean, like over 100 people probably. It is going to be awesome. If you've never been baptized, get baptized. If you're baptized when you were an infant or a little child, you don't remember, get baptized by your own volition. Baptism is like this wedding ring, right? When you see this, you know I'm married. I belong to another. Well, when you're baptized, that's symbolizing to the world you belong to another, and his name is Jesus. All right? Also, on October 18th at 6.30, and you can register online, we have our Who We Are class. This is how we move people into ownership. We don't even say membership. We say ownership. Members are consumers. Owners are participators. So in the Bible, when it says someone's a member of the body of Christ, understand that. Like my arm is a member of my body. It plays a role and a function. So we need you to get into the game. Now, I know some of you are reluctant. You know why? This is what I heard. It's a rumor. I don't know if it's true or not. That people are imperfect. Guys, if you're looking for a perfect church, you're not going to find it until you die. But if you're looking for people who are journeying along the way, this is it. All right? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these beautiful people. I thank you for their stories that are summed up in your story. I pray that we would be overwhelmed with who Jesus is, the mission of Jesus and how we are recipients of his grace and thus become a conduit of his grace, that, that we too would be missionaries who look for the poor, the blind, the oppressed, the captive, whether if they're black, white, yellow, green, Martian, mullet having, high top fade wearing cowboy, big belt buckle, or skinny leg jeans. It don't matter. Your precious blood died for all. May we be those types of missionaries, Lord. And right now I want to pray for those of you saying, hey, Pastor Derwin, man, um, I'm ready to follow Jesus. Something's happening on the inside of me and I'm ready to bow my knee to him and say yes to him. If that's you, you're ready to begin your journey with Jesus. You're ready to, to begin again, a new life, a new power, a new family, a new purpose, if that's you. In this moment, I want you to say this in the silence of your heart. Lord Jesus, I'm ready to begin again. 
I believe that you lived the perfect life I couldn't live because you loved me. I believe you died to death. I should have died to forgive me, to atone for my sins. You are the sacrificial lamb of God. And I believe that on the third day you rose again and you ascended to the right hand of the Father and you sent your Holy Spirit to now make me alive and a part of your family. I've got a new hope, a new power, and a new source of life. And that life is you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. Can we give God a round of applause?